Welcome to the Folk School on Willow Creek, featuring University Distinguished Professor Tom Ezern, singing and telling stories from the Salon on Willow Creek. I need a bed for the night, boys, and my horses need hay. I've been riding that grove line on the hot dish highway. Or my slumbers, a 
mother's prayer and a sister's tears will be mingled there for it is sad to know that the heart throbs over and that it's found dreams I saw, Papa's voice failed there, and gave no heed to his dying prayer, in a narrow grave, six by three, only buried in there. On the lone prairie, oh, but bury me not. On the lone prairie, where the wild coyotes howl on me, where the cold wind screams and the grass. Sunbeams rest on a prairie grave. May the light winged butterfly pause to rest for him who sleeps on the prairie's crest. May the Texas. In that prairie grave, and the cowboys now, as they roam the plain, oh, they marked the spot where his bones have lain, like a handful of roses or his grave. Sunbeams rest on a prairie grave. That cheer you up, Dr. Kelly? Oh, yes. Thank you for that. I wonder that business about the wild coyotes howling over the grave. Sometimes, late at night here on Willow Creek, take Angie the history dog out on the road or back in, along the creek. Actually kind of enjoy it when the coyotes set up a howl, particularly on a moonlit, snow-covered night. It just, uh, well, maybe because we're not alone at that point, it doesn't feel like, huh? <laughs> That song, you've heard it on the Willow Creek Folk School before, perhaps. If not, then somewhere else. Maybe a little bit different words, and there's a reason why there are different words to it. That song is picked up by various song collectors, song catchers, early in the 20th century, among them John Lummox. And he put it into cowboy songs and other frontier ballads, his uh, uh, first great opus in 1910. And how did he go about gathering all those songs? Well, we picture Lomax usually going out there with a cylinder recording, recording, you know, and cranking it up and, and recording the sound out of the air, and he did some of that. 
after Harvard gave him a fellowship to buy the recording equipment. But he got a lot of them by correspondence. And I've come across this here now. This text that I just sang, uh, Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie, otherwise known as the Dying Cowboy. I actually called from the Culbertson Searchlight, Culbertson, Montana, 1909. And I want you to hear the note that goes above it, though. Headline, Cowboy Ballads, a collection being made for printing and preservation by a Texas professor. Now, this is in Colbert, Mon Culbertson, Montana. The following circular letter from Professor John A. Lummox of College Station, Texas, explains itself. Anyone in, the, in Valley County who will send in any such songs, poems, or ballads to the searchlight will receive due credit, and they will be forwarded to Professor Lomax. Uh, and the head letter is headed, The Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas, College Station, December 15, 1908. Editor of the Searchlight. For several years, I've been endeavoring to make a complete collection of the native ballads and songs of the West, particularly those known as cowboy songs. It will hardly be possible to secure such a collection except through the aid of the press, for many of these ballads have never been in print, but, like the Masonic ritual, are transmitted from one generation to another by word of mouth. They deal mainly with frontier episodes, these deeds of desperados like Jesse James and Sam Bass, the life of the ranger in pursuit of Indians or desperados, the experiences of the cowboy going up the trail, the trials of the 49ers, buffalo hunters, stage drivers, and freighters. In short, they are attempts, often crude, sometimes vulgar, to epitomize and particularize the life of the pioneers who people the vast region west of the Mississippi River. Such early pioneer ballads do exist. Although I have collected nearly 100, I wish to solicit your aid in preserving from extinction this expression of American literature. Eventually, it is expected that the ballads would be published in book form and made available for students of history or for those interested in the songs merely as an expression of romantic Western life. And he goes on, asking the editor to help him gather the ballads, and send them in to him at College Station. And that's where Lomax's early collections came from, predominantly. This one, then, we tracked upstream to Culbertson, Montana, this particular song. It was one of several that the editor there in Culbertson gathered, and then before he sent them to Professor Lomax, or maybe afterward, but you know, when he, when he gathered them for Lomax, he published them in the newspaper. And there's this particularly fetching version of the dying cowboy there. A little bit different text than others. And it's a text to be cherished. It's unfiltered. You know, Lomax took his collections and he kind of mixed them together. I've got three versions of this. We'll, we'll pick this verse, that verse, that verse. But this, is, this is as it was turned in. Incidentally, uh, it, specifically, it was brought into the newspaper office by, down here, Yeah. <laughs> it was brought to the Searchlight office by Mrs. George Reynolds of Cub Culbertson. There we go. Get the credit in. So that's the real deal of the dying cowboy. Check the bison score lately, Dr. Kelly. I haven't, but I several people chiming in here are wishing good luck. Oh. Oh, Samford, zero, Bulldog, I mean, uh, Bison, 24? 24. 24 zip, yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay. We're not going to worry too much about them. You better get back to work. Yeah. Um, we won't have our friend Alan Burke with us on mine tonight. Uh, no, but he'll be checking in with us tomorrow after he's recuperated a little bit from surgery. Yeah, Alan, um, who is such a mover and shaker with everything to do with letterpress printing and collection and preservation, um, had to have some surgery this week. So he's not going to be watching tonight, but Leah, I understand, will be there. So hello, Leah. Leah, pass our condolences and good wishes along. <laughs> Yeah, Alan says he'll he'll watch the rerun later. 
Attendance is not required in situations <laughs> yes, like this, not. Alan, but appreciate yes, it. Any other big news from the press lately? Well, yeah, I'm going to say some things, uh, not so much about a book, but about hirings and various um, things to do with staffing. So yesterday, I was able to hire a new graduate assistant who will be working with the press beginning January 16. So we're happy to welcome Min Hoin to the staff. Um, and he already comes with some experience in marketing and publicity. So. I'm going to be counting on that. I'm very glad to have him on board. He's an English major. Welcome to men. Um, working with creative writing. So, um, he'll start soon. Um, and also, I received a faculty fellow, which came with an, a cash award that I'm applying toward a, another hire that I hope to take place next fall, looking for and a student who's interested in working with our Contemporary Voices of Indigenous Peoples series. So that money, I'm put, setting aside there as seed money to um, pay for having a student come in to work with that. It'll be a great experience for that student, and it will be some much needed help as well. And then I want to also mention past students who have worked with us. Today was Hannah Slater's last day. She popped in as an intern, taking up uh, when Oliver left for his fabulous job in the cities. So Hannah um, ably took care of things. Today was her last day, though. She graduates next week. And she's also headed to the cities, come to think of it. And then there's um, the crew that Oliver was working with out at Battle Lake. Tonight, the public history class is, is presenting a documentary that they made at the Fargo Theater, downtown Fargo Theater. And from past events that they've had, I know they'll draw a nice big crowd. So kudos to all those public history now, students. I don't know if you've seen the uh, uh, marquee of the Fargo Theater yeah. uh, emblazoned uh, NDSU Public History Program presents whatever the Battle of the Back. It's called The Branches of Battle Lake. Okay, uh, and I had ESPN on for the Bison game a little while ago. <laughs> they were doing a, a context shot from downtown Fargo. Yes, there's, there it is. There's, <laughs> there's our, our students' marquee on the Fargo Theater out over, uh, nationwide over ESPN. Oh, now that is very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, well. Uh, someone else you might watch it out for on the timeline in case he shows up. And if he is, he should make his presence known to accept the congratulations of the public, Aaron <laughs> Barth, on the final, yes, final, final, su final? submission of his dissertation and uh, okay. on the historical memory of the Dakota War. Yep, if you're there, Dakota Aaron, Canada. say howdy. Yeah. Yeah. Marla reports that tomorrow they're having deer steaks for dinner. Oh, yeah. Cleaning out the freezer, getting ready. Making room. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, there is a kind of a transition uh, to a next song I'm going to feature here. Uh, and, and it's in the person of John Lummox, whom I mentioned before, the ballad uh, collector, the song catcher from uh, College Station, who's, as, as you can tell then, his fingers reach all the way up to Montana and North Dakota. A song that I picked up from his 1910 book, many years ago, but I personally, I haven't sung this song in 30 years, I don't think. Oh, I sang it like yesterday, right here, but I mean, I haven't sung it to anybody in, in 30 years. It's a song called Sioux Indians. Now, as I say, he, sung, he, he got it somewhere, and he doesn't attribute, he doesn't say where he got it. But there it is in his 1910 book. And I've kind of laid it aside until here recently, Oh yeah, yeah. Here's my, here's my stuff. Of all things, in the Billings Gazette, Billings, Montana, 1971, I ran across this reference, reference that a fellow named um, Harry Owens there in Billings had run across some handwritten manuscripts that belonged to his, to his father the late Harry Ward Owens, and in them was a set of stanzas. And when I looked at that stuff, 
and they published these stanzas in the newspaper there in Billings in 1971. I looked at those and I said, I used to sing that song 30 years ago. <laughs> and, there, and there it is. But, but it's entitled differently. Uh, Lummox called it The Sioux Indians. And it's a song of the Overland Trail and an attack on a, a caravan of travelers on the Overland Trail. This one is called specifically The Prospector. And so the stanzas are massaged a little bit to be about gold miners going to Montana. But it starts out the same way. I'll sing you a song and it may be a sad one. And it goes on and goes on. And there's conflict and there's hardship and they eventually get through, but not all of them. And uh, so this song is just, it, it's uh, unknown to the people there. But here this fellow brings it out and he says, I wonder where that song came from. Well, you know, I can kind of tell you where it came from. Well, not exactly, except I can tell you that it's, it's it found in other places in the plains. Here since then, now I found another text that comes from Spokane, Washington in 1932. And a lot of these texts are coming from out in the western states, you see, west of the Great Plains, because it's a song of the Overland Trails along the Platte River. And this one's called, in this case, it's called Crossing the Plains. And some woman there, what's her name? Yeah, a woman named Stella Hendren sent it into the Spokane Chronicle just because it was an interesting old song that she had uh, learned from her, her family. And it's, it's a whole bunch of stanzas very similar to others that I found in other sources here. The place the song has most particularly persisted, however, is in Utah because the Mormon migration also followed the Platte River route and they knew this song. Now what I'm getting here is that travelers like to Oregon, farmers, prospectors going to Montana and other parts of the American West, Mormons headed for Utah, they all had their own ver versions of, the, of this same basic song. Um, and there's stuff in it. You know, this song, uh, first off there are racial, racial images. Indians appear a certain way in this song. And quite similar to the way they appear in other uh, songs of uh, Anglo-Saxon travelers on the Overland Trails, they appear as yelling hordes, nameless savages. That's the image that comes out in the songs here. Uh, there are definite racial images in here. And at one point in the song, uh, the author or someone, uh, depending on the version of it, shoots what they perceive, the fellow they perceive to be the chief of the attacking Indians, and they all quit them, and they go away. See, this perception that these are tribal people, uh, they aren't self, they can't organize themselves. They have to have a boss, you see, and take him away, and they're helpless. Whereas the, the, the Anglo-Americans in the caravan, as predicted, predicted in these ballads, this one and others like it, they, they self-organize. Uh, they quickly organize a defense, and they rally around, and nobody has to tell them what to do. Frequently the songs have words like, we sprang to our places. You know, they all knew how to, they all knew how to defend themselves. But Austin and Alta Fife, great Mormon folklorists, have collected versions of this song. They circled our camp with a horrible din, a shooting their arrows, but we fought them like sin. Okay, that's just got a little bit of tint of Mormon culture there, I think. They tried hard to rout us with arrow and bow, and we tried to hit them but they rode too low. <laughs> I thought that was actually a pretty good set of lines right there. The next day we left there and started to find the famous Great Salt Lake and the tall western pines. We all got there safely, but the two that were slain. We left them the rest on the wild, dismal plains. And there's <laughs> the link right back to the first ballad of the night, right? But nothing worse is being buried out there on the prairie. I don't know. Coyote Chorus sounds like a pretty good funeral chorus to me. I'm going to sing the version that Lomax recorded in 1910, and very similar to the others. And the points that I've made about it, uh, they're going to be uh, pretty evident, I think. What key do I like here? Mm -hmm. I'll sing you a song, though it may be a sad one, of 
trials and troubles and where first begun. I left my dear kindred, my friends and my home Across the wild desert and the mountains to roam Across the Missouri and joined a large train Which bore us o'er mountain and valley and plain And often of the evenings out a hunting we'd go to shoot the fleet antelope and the wild buffalo. Now we heard of Sioux Indians out on the plains, killing poor drivers and burning their trains, killing poor drivers with arrows and bows. By the end, no mercy they showed. We traveled three weeks till we came to the lat, and we pitched out our tents at the end of the flat. We spread down our blankets on the green grassy ground. Our horses and mules were raging. While taking refreshment, we heard a low yell, the whoop of two Indians coming up from the dell. We sprang to our rifle with a flash in each eye. Boys, says our brave leader, will fight till we die. They made a bold dash and came near to our train and their arrows fell around us like the hail and like rain but with our long rifles we fed them cold and till many a brave warrior around us lay dead well, we shot the bold chief at the head of his band and he died like a warrior with a gun in his hand. When they saw their bold chief lying dead in his gore, they went and they yelled and they saw them no more. With our small band, there were just twenty-four, and the Sioux Indians there were five hundred or more. We fought them with courage, we spoke not a word till the end of the battle was all that was earned. Pitched up our horses and we started our train. Three more bloody battles, the strip on the plain. In our last battle, three of our great boys fell, and we left them to rest in a green shady dell. I was just wondering whether Eric Longy is tuned in here tonight. If he is, he's having a hoot out there that ballot. I haven't seen Eric chime in, but MJ Bremner and Denise have some things to say. I bet they do. <laughs> and that's the sort of images that come forward from the ballot. And the power of words. The power of words. Naming and, yes. Yes, indeed. And um, uh, the ballot to borrow from one another. And these are how historical images get laid down and put in place. Mm -hmm. Well, Denise writes 500 Sioux with quotation marks. 500 of them, yeah. 500, yeah. Uh, they got a good count. <laughs> yeah, it's...
But that ballot did make the, make the rounds and it seemed to pass from one group to another. So it, it, it survived most of all among Mormons, but it shows up in little border towns and moments picks it up from various points. One thing about this is it is an Overland Trail ballot, so it's even pre-range cattle industry. You know, you got all this cowboy songs that get collected by the uh, song catcher. They kind of get set down in some version. But these from the Overland Trails, it's more helter-skelter as to what survives. Well, pretty much everything this week is fairly raw from the field. Recent discoveries and that sort of thing. Got any other guests weighing in on the chat land tonight? Well, I'm going to mention some some good news that happened with Denise Lajmodier. Yeah. She just was awarded a writer's retreat um, trip. I don't know exactly what all you call it. it comes with funding. And oh, the Homer point. Alaska gig. She's going to Homer, Alaska. Indeed. And so my sister, I think, is out there listening and. She'll remember when we made trips to Homer um, as kids with our family. Lots of rocks on the spit out there and fish and all kinds of... I'm sure it's changed quite a bit since the time we were 10 and 12 years old, but still, it would be a great trip out there. Um, Denise will have a terrific view. It will be just lovely walks. Hopes, I hope she's going in spring or summer and not right now. <laughs> I don't know when she actually goes. It'll be nicer there in spring, though, than it is right now, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Although there may be mosquitoes, that might be something else to contend with. Well, anything that uh, She's gets... She's going in the spring. That's good. Denise, back to writing, because we always want more work from her. Right? And I know she's working on some really good stuff already, and I won't say more about it, because that puts pressure on the writers. Yeah. But this retreat is it's something, she's earned it for one thing, get out there and she's proven that if she has the time to sit and contemplate and write and take those walks that she can produce. So, good for her. Here in a minute. I'm going back to 1896, and then the song from 1896 takes us back to 1886. Say again? Keep your voice up. Keep your voice up? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm tired tonight. Quiet. <laughs> it's been a long week. Going back to 1896 with this next song, and the song itself then reaches back to 1886 to recount events there. I ran across this song in the Valentine Democrat, Valentine, Nebraska, Cherry County, Nebraska Sandhills country. Uh, and it's uh, uh, under Wood Lake Department, meaning it's published in the Valentine Democrat, uh, covering affairs in Wood Lake, which is down a town down southeast of Valentine. And it's a uh, byline to Leroy Leach, the editor. The following verses are respectfully dedicated to C.A. Johnson, Esquire, in memory of the past. Hmm. And then, in, when you get into it, it appears like there's all sorts of insider humor of old settlers. Except, sometimes you can begin to decode some of that stuff with the power of digital source material. I'm calling this uh, ballad it wasn't given a title, but I'm taking it from like the first line, when Beckett came to town. And the figure has to do with the misadventures of a fellow named Beckett, who showed up in Wood Lake in 1886, yeah, according to the ballad. And I'm convinced that this ballad recounts semi-true incidents from 1886. Definitely one-sided, as told by the balladeer himself. Uh, and he dedicates it to C.H. Oh, and this fellow, Leroy Leach, the editor, evidently writes ballads now and then about local affairs. He dedicates it to C.A. Johnson. And I wonder, okay, who, what, who's this guy? And, and what's he, his involvement? Well, C.A. Johnson. Yeah. Okay, local history discloses 
C.A. Johnson was a New Yorker whose family moved him to Wisconsin. He went to a seminary for a while. Um, in other words, studied to preach. And after leaving school, he taught in the schools, public schools in Wisconsin. But somehow, he put away a little money, began investing in land, took his grub stake out to Wood Lake, Nebraska in 1884. Two years later, starting out with a, with a sod house and a claim shanty, two years later, though, he established a bank in Wood Lake. So he's quite an uh, energetic fellow. Um, eventually, he was, his interest in land, cattle, and banking would spread also into southern South Dakota. But he's always identified there with Wood Lake, and then that ties him to the nearby larger town of Valentine. Here's a note in the 7th of May of 1896. Yeah. A little bit of the context where this ballad came from. At about the same time, the ballad appears. An entertainment given in honor, honor given in, in Wood Lake in honor of the 10th anniversary of Mr. and Mrs. Willis Barnard. And the news article says this fellow, C.A. Johnson Esquire, that's the way it calls him, C.A. Johnson Esquire, and he's become a, sort of a local gentry, um, was remarrying. They were conducting a second marriage uh, celebration, you see, for the couple on the 10-year anniversary. And the, at which point it said, the peace of South B Avenue was disturbed for 20 minutes by demonstrative friends. So they had a sort of a shivery going. And then it said that later in the evening, David Hanna, John West, W. Bernard, and C.A. Johnson all favored the guests with interesting accounts of early life in Cherry County. And that same night, then, uh, Editor Leach performed a ballad, The Tin Wedding, it was called, dedicated to the celebrants, Mr. and Mrs. Barnard. Okay, so now we're getting there. There's this clique, this gang of old settlers who've got memories that they share and favorite stories that they tell, and that's the origin of this ballad. The ballad tells the story of a fellow named Beckett coming to town, tells us nothing about him. I, began, I had to search quite a bit. I think I know who the Beckett they're referring to is. Beckett. I found it, all right, bear with me. This is from a history of the Federal District Court of Nebraska by your friend John Wonder, Dr. Oh, yeah. yes. Western historian. And just in one of his footnotes, here's a little write-up about William Beckett's promising but checkered career was descending into tragedy. This was in 1902. In late 1902, Beckett's much longer, younger wife, Ella, divorced him on grounds of habitual drunkenness. Several weeks later, Beckett's body was discovered frozen stiff in a snowbank near Benson, where he had apparently wandered aimlessly before succumbing to the winter cold. His nephew then married his wife, raised his kids as their own. But the suspicious thing is, looking at the Omaha Herald's, World Herald's account of this, Beckett, an exceedingly eminent attorney, well known in Nebraska and particularly in Omaha, Mr. Beckett was last seen by this Mr. Woodrow, who would then subsequently marry his wife. Was last seen by him? Was last seen by him at 1.30 in the morning, leaving to go back to his lodgings. Oh, huh. And this was after, shortly after his wife had divorced him for habitual drunkenness. Now, what I'm coming back around to is this guy Beckett is an attorney, and by all accounts, a brilliant attorney with a real weakness for the bottle, and physically and a, a striking character. And so when the ballot says Beckett came to down, you're supposed to know who Beckett is, except we don't know anymore unless you, you know, dig, dig it out that Beckett is a celebrated character in these days. We don't know why Beckett came to town in Wood Lake, Nebraska in 1884, in the days of the open range cattlemen and just a few uh, bottomland farmers moving in. But somebody brought him in, you see, in some kind of dispute, and he was not welcome to Mr. Johnson and Mr. Leach and others of this clique of old top timers of which I speak. And as to what happened then, when the tall, gaunt, but distinguished attorney alighted from the passenger car in 
Wood Lake, Nebraska, in 1886, is recounted in the ballad. Oh, yes. What I determined pretty soon was this song is closely related to the cowboy song, Zebra Dunn. Okay, Beckett came to town. It was in the spring of 86, Beckett came to town. From the car steps, clad in black, he slowly clambered down. He wasn't much to look at, being somewhat angular. He gazed in innocence around while getting off the car. He early demonstrated in accents firm and sound that Beckett was a talker, the best from far around. He talked of spiritualism, politics at home, and into Greek mythology with long strides did he roam. He didn't seem to realize that there were others there who wanted chances equalized in the oratorical chair. At last he spoke of Kansas, and of the Flint Hill steep, told us how the ranchmen there shot all their little sheep. Could hear the boys objected, and votes from all were taken, of which the larger portion said that Beckett was mistaken. He talked from early morning until the shades of eve, and when it was bedtime, he seemed to hate to leave. But the boys grew rather weary, and one night, Air seeking rest, resolved the friend, let friend Beckett know that he was in the West. Accordingly, a notice was posted in the stores, which read, the Sioux are coming with knives and forty-fours. When the shades of night came down and settled o'er the swells, the quiet air was broken by wild and woolly hills. This proved effective, Beckett stopped, and with some chilly thrills, he grabbed his hat and large valise and started for the hill. Then from behind large bonfires glow, wild yells the air did shake. While in the thunderous roar of guns, Beckett swam the lake. Next day he wandered back again, and in the quavering trill, told how he finally spied a light from off, of, off a high sand hill. This proved to be a neighbor's house, who, pitying Beckett's flight, allowed the man the editor, and there he spent a night. We'd like to see friend Beckett now, and should he happen down, we take him round to see the sights in this our little town. For off we see, often dreams we see him, off we see his face in pain. Just as it looked next morning when he took Eastbound train. There are a lot of great cowboy ballads about, you know, a stranger rides into camp and either he turns out to be an idiot and they run him out, or he turns out to be smarter than anybody expected and he proves himself. And you know, Well, okay, this is one where it takes a different, little bit of different turn. Becca, the attorney run out of town from Wood Lake in 1886. And that's when none of the song catchers picked up. Picked it up about a week ago. Well, we need to say that uh, we got one more Willow Creek Folk School in, what year are we in? 2000 and, 2022. There's only one more. That's next week. Yep. Same time, same place. Next week. Willow Creek Folk School number 124. And then none on the 23rd of December, none on the 30th of December, none on the 6th of January, because we're trying to have actual lives, would be the way to put it, I suppose. Is that right? We'll be on the road. Yeah, we'll be traveling, traveling hard during that time. But we are hoping to do the trap line and see pretty much all of our family. Pretty much all of them that'll have us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get quite as far west as my brother's place in Washington, but... We're going to get over to New Mexico. It's possible there will be guests for next week of Willow Creek Folk School. Oh? Depending on when they come in from Oklahoma. Yes. Okay. In which case, it will greatly improve the musical quality of the enterprise. Is Mike 
gonna bring his trombone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even suggest that. <laughs> we haven't had a trombone yet. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, but we, we do look forward to it. Uh, there's new material again. I, you know, uh, Dr. Kelly wakes up some reasonable hour of the morning after I've been up at an unreasonable hour of the morning. And that's usually when I'm, uh, time that I spend discovering ballads. You know, I'm combing through old documents from the 19th century, discovering texts. And then she comes down, before she had her coffee, she, then she gets hit with a new one. Uh, it doesn't always, appre doesn't have a full appreciation for the <laughs> excitement of discovery at that point sometimes. And this week it was the discovery, a fellow named Prawl, a farmer, uh, cattleman, logger, part-time preacher, and poet from Wolf Point, Montana. Uh, some of his work is going to figure next week. And some things of the season, shall we say. Anything else we need to say yet this week, Dr. Taylor? I'm just going to point out that the poinsettias that you have on display here, on the screen, because of the lighting, they look a little bit salmon color. Salmon? <laughs> but they are a rich, pretty red, so. All right. Tis the season, yes indeed. Well, before concluding, uh, I want to make note of the birthday of Franz Rigaby, one of the great song catchers of the Northern he was born on the 15th of December of 1889, you know, the year that uh, so many things turned a, a page on the Great Plains in places like uh, the Oklahoma Territory, in places like the Dakota Territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of significance attending to that date. Well, it's the birth date of Franz Rickaby, who eventually came to the University of North Dakota, walking in, carrying his fiddle, and commenced collecting ballads. Uh, he also wrote the University of North Dakota fight song, which they seldom get to sing because they seldom score a touchdown. And formed a, 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 a theatrical group there. It, it just one of these really charismatic young professors who then, who's a physician's told him, uh, you can't live in North Dakota anymore. Um, we're talking about early 1920s. Uh, this climate's going to kill you. Uh, he had a weak heart, moved out to California. A year later, he died. Too young, in my opinion. Uh, he's somebody with a genuine appreciation of the country who cast down his bucket where he was, and he filled that bucket up with folk songs of the land. One day, he showed up at a farmhouse in Walsh County, northeastern part of North Dakota, not that far from Grand Forks. But he was, he traveled in the dead of winter sometimes. Showed up at the farmhouse. It was a family of rather successful farmers. They were immigrants from uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, they lived in a nice two-story house. I've seen a photograph of the house where they lived. So, staple, pillars of the farming community there in Walsh County. And I picked, he was looking for ballads. The, the key encounter, I picture this in my mind. All, all they have is his manuscript, you know. The, the, here's the ballad as he took it down, or the ballads as he took them down. But I, I picture this one, something like this. If you're, those of you who do this kind of field work in oral history or folklore, you know, the kitchen table is where things happen, particularly of an older generation if you're interviewing women. And he was interviewing the lady of the house. Sat down. And I picture this at, at a kitchen table. Um, Pre-electrification, kerosene lamps, and that conversation across the table, exchanging songs. And... Knowing that Franz Rickaby had not much time at all to live after this, I thought he deserved a ballad of his own. 
about his sense of balladry on the Great Plains. And it was on that ballad that the farm woman he visited sang for him an old sea song. And this is in a farmhouse in Walsh County, North Dakota, but this sailor's song, Bury Me Not in the Deep, Deep Sea. Now, it didn't happen at the kitchen table that night, but somewhere, somehow, that song became the genesis of the first song I sang tonight, Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie. Bury Me Not in the Deep, Deep Sea, Bury Me Not becomes Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie. And sure enough, he, she sang that song to him. And I, I, I can't get that episode out of my head. I can all day long sleeping under the sky Chasing after ballads, my fiddle and I Packing my life full, living every day Every dawn a gift, another tune to play So bury me not in the deep, deep sea Let the coyote run on the lone prairie So many songs Still to be sung So let me be Forever young Once again this is for the song catcher Franz Rickaby The balladeer's life I would not exchange I'm traveling line on an open range Like a vast library Stories every day Maybe a stage in my life's a play Let the coyote run on the lone prairie. So many songs still to be sung. So let me be forever young. Many miles to go before I sleep. I made and I must keep Shadows race across Yellow fields of grain Winter night descend on a northern plain So bury me not In the deep, deep sea Let the coyote run On the lone prairie Kitchen table with a kerosene light Farmhouse ballad on a prairie night Some dying words, burial at sea Kitchen walls flicker mortality So bury me in the deep, deep sea let the coyote run on the lone prairie. So many songs still to be sung. So let me be forever young. Across the 
rosary joined the large train which bore us over mountain and valley and plain often though evening that hunting we go shoot the fleet and look and the wild buffalo Butterfly, pause to rest for him who sleeps on the prairie's crest. May the Texas rose in the breeze's wave for him who sleeps in a prairie grave. That was in the spring of '86. car steps, clad in black, he slowly clambered down, there uh, wasn't much to look at, being somewhat angular, and he gazed into the sense around while getting off the car. So bury me not in the deep, deep sea, let the coyote run on the low so many songs still to be sung, so let me be forever young. The seldom is heard, but a scourging word. And the skies are not cloudy, are not cloudy all the day. No, the skies are not cloudy all the day. Dr. Kelly. We now conclude today's edition of the Folk School on Willow Creek. We invite you to join us again next Friday at 8 p.m. Central Time for more songs and stories. <laughs>